Ladies and gentlemen, people of all gender expressions, thank you for checking out the North Bank Media Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Strevens. And it's that time again, we've ran through another 10 episodes, so as is tradition, I have to sit down and work on some ideas that have sort of been building over the course of this show and sort of presenting themselves to me through my conversations with the guests and uh, just through sort of being semi-aware, uh, semi-aware and semi-lucid in the universe and, and just sort of seeing some things that I, I can't not think about and now I'm obligated to talk about because I've started the show. So, you know, I, I, I think back to a conversation I had with uh, a girl who was on this show and we, we got into it a little bit on Instagram. Uh, not in a antagonistic way, but but she was again. I mean, her way of looking at things is was was very much um, you know identitarian or intersectionalist, and I think that that way of looking at things is is it's very popular these days, and I think there is some utility to it. Uh, but what I said was that you know to to really uh, to really affect some change, I think we would have to rethink what it what it meant to be human. You know, I started thinking about a revolution of the self. And uh, I suppose, and I'll get into this a little later in this episode here, but I talked to a guy yesterday for an episode, and the idea that he talked about was truly, I think, revolutionary uh, on a social level. And so I guess on a, on a, on a, on a show, on a, a platform that I uh, claim is for the free expression of ideas, um, I, I think maybe it's time to start thinking about what a revolution really might be. I guess the first time I really sat down to think about this i also thought about the word revolt which which comes up again and again in my in my thinking uh, as it comes from albert camus writing the french great french writer who was writing uh, in sort of the middle of the 20th century he died in 1960 and i started wondering does the word revolt and the word revolution like is that the same root and it turns out that they were so that, that's a lucky guess but um they both come from the same latin a verb, I guess, uh, meaning to roll back. Okay, now you remember, you remember for Camus. Before we get too crazy in the etymology, another another field of study I have no business commenting on. But for Camus, revolt is remember the the ultimate revolt, the ultimate let's say revolutionary act is to choose to live, right? Is to is to is to say that life is worth living, even though, even though. Uh, it, it, it's inherently meaningless, right? Uh, we search and search and search, the human mind does, for a rational explanation for life and for our place in the universe. And to ultimately realize that A, it probably doesn't, it does not exist, and B, our mind is incapable of understanding it. So then if life is meaningless, it, it's, rev it's a revolutionary act to choose to live and to not kill yourself. And it's also, it's revolutionary, it's, it's a revolt to refuse to have a rational meaning imposed on you from anywhere else but yourself. Right, so to me, I think, and I've said this before, the real change, and now I'm going to say the real revolution, uh, would begin within in the self, within the individual. Now, that Latin word, revolver, originally meant to roll back. And that actually first showed itself in the language uh, around in the mid 1500s, and it referred to a celestial body that was orbiting, and it actually meant that it would roll back, that it would return in a predictable way. That you can imagine the orbit. But strangely enough, around the same time, it then began to take on pretty well the opposite meaning to roll back as in to remove one's allegiance to a cause. You can understand. You could see how that would then contribute to the our understanding of the word revolt and uh, and revolution right to roll back to remove one's allegiance to a cause so i think what i'm going to talk about here a little bit is this idea of rolling back one's allegiance to our old self you know so with that in mind i've kind of been thinking about you know what would a revolution really look like and again i just said it i'll say it again i believe that any any change that's possible any any perception of change uh, it it comes from within it has to start within but but dig this man <laughs> i talked about this a little bit in the last episode when i saw the bee b bouncing from flower to flower and i thought to myself well 
Why do, why do I see myself as actually being separate from the bee, separate from the flower? Why do I see the, the bee as being separate from the flower, right? I've come, to, I've come to believe, and you may choose to agree or disagree, that the self, the, the idea of the self, me, is not truly uh, separate from the universe at large. That's right. We're all, there's an energy, a life force that flows through all living things. I don't know what it is. I understand that this is starting to leave the plane of reality, <laughs> but uh, that's pretty much where this show uh, seems to want to go. You know, I don't, uh, this is where the interest takes me, so forgive me. But there is a life force in all living things. And I, I really believe that the universe, whether it's a sentient thing or just a thing that is alive, like a plant, there is a, a force that flows. And to see myself as being separate from anything in the universe is not true because we're all imbued with the same life force. We're all the energy, the whatever it is, the spirit of the universe moves from me to you, to the bee, to the plant. It's all, it's a, it's a, it's continuous and it's whole. And part of seeing myself as a self and seeing the plant as the plant and the pillow here, well, the pillow's not alive so far as we know, but the bird that I see just now, that's part of the way that humans come to understand their world largely so that they can survive, right? To make sense of the world, to map out the world and then to survive. But what if we started thinking about uh, our, me, you, the people I just saw walk by, as being actually fundamentally the same thing and not a different thing, right? So if we, can, if we can at least entertain that thought, then we can say, well, the commitment to changing myself, you know, the commitment to rolling back my allegiance to my old self, you know, to becoming something different, well, that's actually a commitment to changing the universe. You got to believe that. You are capable of changing the universe through your actions, Right, because if if you yourself are not um, in any in any shape or form isolated from the whole of the universe, then if you change yourself, if you seek to improve yourself, if you seek to connect with new people, if you seek to uh, raise your children as best you can, if you seek to uh, foster a <laughs> foster a, an abandoned animal, let's say to the best of your ability and grow that thing into its, uh, a realization of its potential, then that's something like the energy in the universe flowing from one node, you, through to those other things, right? You're allowing the potential of the universe to exist by flowing through you. You know, I was just reading this article I talked about how a gigantic supernova somewhere in the reaches of outer space is, res is, is responsible for half of the calcium in the universe. You know what that might mean? It's like, you've heard this before. It was either Neil deGrasse Tyson or, or maybe it was Carl Sagan before him who said, we are literally made of stardust, right? Like all the elements that exist in our body that, that compose me and you and the rest of the universe... It's all the same thing, right? Like we are made of the composite materials that make up everything else in the universe, the gigantic stars to the, to the microscopic amoeba, whatever, tardigrades, those little things that live out in space. Check that out. Well, they can live in space, the tardigrade. So even, even Moby, you know, when he said we're all made of stars, or when Joni Mitchell said, we are stardust, we are golden, and we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. Okay, that's something like a revolution, right? That's something like uh, maybe rolling back to, to, to a, a new way of being, but also to the, the true way of being. You know, and, and our, you know, my friend Devin Bailey often says that if, if, our, if our culture had any connection to mythology, you know, we'd... We wouldn't be in as much of a mess as we are, possessed by ideas, possessed by uh, technology in some sense. You know, so to, to see ourselves literally as stardust, made of stars, and the fact that the stardust has congealed, let's say, into you, well, that's nothing short of a miracle. 
You know, and the fact that those, those, those composite elements even exist. Uh, and if we're to believe the scientific theory of the Big Bang, the fact that any of it even exists, period, is a miracle. Whatever existed before the Big Bang was something like the realm of, of miracles, right? This is an idea from Jordan Peterson, where the rules of physics and, and, and all that, all of that dictates the fact that that didn't truly begin, <clears throat> our perception of time didn't truly begin until the Big Bang. Well, whatever was going on before the Big Bang was something like a miracle. Okay, but so if the universe is, 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 let's say, realizing itself through us, right? If we are the nodes of energy, um, energy accumulation, let's say, or, or uh, places, points on a map, I think node is the right word. If, we're the, if we as individuals are the places where the universal energy flows through, then it's, it's incumbent on us to allow that flow to happen. But to me immediately the idea of the self first and foremost can in fact be destructive or or counterproductive to that flow right now i have to stop here and say that i also do believe that the world that we live in requires uh it requires the ego it requires desire to some extent it requires greed you know not greed in a sinful sense but the drive to produce to build and to have for me and and those around me, that that vision, that individual creativity is necessary uh, to advancement. So again, I'm also trying to get away from dealing in these hard, hard binaries to say, well, what is needed and what is not. I'm, it's impossible, really, but I, I'm starting to pick up on 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 trade offs or on ba- on the balance that exists. And I may say that the self in some ways is, is counterproductive to the flow of, un- of the, the universe, period. The self is also very necessary and very, very necessary, yes, to, to produce anything at all, right? I was sitting, um, having coffee with my friend Roberto, uh, Roberto Alice, who's been on the show a few times, entrepreneur, a uh, guy that moved here from El Salvador and uh, has made a, lot, a great life for himself, but he was saying, I'm not going to do the accent, even though I love Roberto's accent. He was saying, you know, it's it's crazy that you you see you see everything you see in front of you. Everything you see in front of you was at one time uh, nothing but a vision in someone's mind. And so, so a to have that vision, and then b to have the ego to say that my vision needs to be imposed upon the world is is uh, it, it's necessary. It's vital to having all that we have. You know, even. Even the tree-lined streets and the manicured grass, you know, that so that was somebody's vision to shape that. And then all the physical, uh, material, commercial, um, human inventions that, that you, I mean, wherever you're sitting, look wherever you're sitting, whoever you are, tell me what you see. Well, don't I won't be able to hear you, but everything you see, that was once the vision in somebody's mind. Okay, but... That's all well and good, but I, I also think that this this ego, this this seeing me as being the self, seeing me as being a, you know, a, a sort of isolated unit. You know, I'm thinking now about that saying, "No man is an island." I think that no man is an island. I think that's absolutely true, because because the self gives us somewhere to retreat to. You know, within the self, I can go into myself and I can be selfish. And I can actually resist the flow of that universe, of the universe, right? When I retreat into myself and, and do, do things that are only self-serving and things that aren't even necessarily self-serving, but just do, just do things that are easy, do things that are essentially uh, counterproductive, do things that are a waste of time, do things that are a waste of potential and energy. I'm retreating into the self and being selfish and therefore I have become a dead end for the universe's energy, which is trying to flow through me. You know, I said last time, right, that uh, time, we know time is flowing eternally and, and, and we get to exist brief, briefly within that stream, you know, like a popcorn kernel that into existence floats along and then is snuffed out, used up, burns to a cinder, becomes nothing. But, and, and, and of course we're, we're so, in some ways cursed, but also in some ways blessed to see ourselves within that stream, right? Like, like most other animals don't have a full conception of the past. 
the present and the future. You know, we can see here's where I've been. Here I am now in the moment. And here is where I'm going. I mean, and good on you if you have a sense of where you're going. Even some, even some form of, um, even some form of an understanding of where you might be going, right? To see ourselves across those that temporal stream is a miracle, also. I think, um, you know, to add to that, I would say also space, as we know, is expanding eternally. What about energy? I actually have no idea. I'm not. I'm clearly not a. <laughs> a physicist or a, an astronaut or, or whoever might be um, qualified to make such a such a statement. Is, is the universe a closed system? Is there a finite amount of energy that's always transferring? It's possible. The point being, you know, time and space and energy flow, right? And if we close off to that, if we, if we refuse to think about our past in any meaningful way, if we refuse to explore this world, if we refuse to explore our own mind, our own thoughts, our own bodies, if we refuse to transfer energy, as I said, to that fostered animal that you're looking after, to, to raising your child, to that business connection, to that coffee, uh, that coffee date, that, that get together with a friend, that beers around the fire, whatever it may be, that this podcast is that. It's, it's me taking what little half-baked ideas I have and through verbal energy and through mental energy, throwing them out there uh, into somebody else, transferring through me. I'm doing my best to allow the universe's energy. I'm translating it into something, something like something that's understandable and moving it to another node, right? That's what we humans are essentially doing in a lot of ways. The universe's energy is flowing through us, right? But if we, if we close off to that, as I was saying, if we close off to that, if we, if we don't communicate, if we don't reach out, if we don't explore, if we don't talk, if we don't create, however badly, if we don't do, if we don't act, if we don't produce, then you are literally fighting against the most, uh, the most um, massive, magnificent, unstoppable force, and that is all the universe. Okay, so what's the solution there then? If you, if you feel that sense of existential dread. If you feel like I'm not doing, I'm not producing, I'm not, I'm not living up to, my, to who I think I could be. The answer is to let go and stop resisting. Because, because if you are the universe, right? If you are the universe realizing itself, if you are this miraculous energy that flows all you have to do, and it's incredibly easy in theory, is let it go and let it flow. And what flows, that's where you go. You know, and I, you may say, this makes absolutely no sense. And that's possible. And it may, I think to me, it makes sense in theory. You know, I, I, one thing I'd like to get better at is, is, is giving examples. And I, I'm trying here. I hope, I hope it's helping. You know, choose to live. Okay, choose life. Realize that even if you are a Christian, even if you are uh, any any religion, even if you do subscribe to some sort of uh, external rationality, a religion, a cult, I'm not judging. Choose to live. Choose to realize that your life does have meaning, meaning that you yourself have have found within. And as Albert Camus said, live with passion. He said. Within the depths of an endless winter, I found within me an eternal summer. Now you may say, well, you know, this is ridiculous. I'm not the universe realizing itself. I'm just me. I'm just sitting here doing my thing. That's what the universe... Think about that. However old the universe is, billions of years, right? It led to you. <laughs> so you have to own that. And I really think these are the first steps to a, a revolution, period. A revolution of the self, first and foremost. Ridiculous, insane thoughts to see the entire scope of existence culminating in you. Where else would a revolution come from but to see yourself not as just the end of a family tree, 
you know, not as the outermost branches of a family tree, uh, of a species, of a citizen, of a country, you know, but of the, you are an, a living, breathing, pulsating, flesh and blood node of a universe that has been roiling and boiling for billions of years and you popped up. Any, any resistance to that is, is, is futile for one and it'll lead to some form of mental illness or dread. If you don't understand the weight of the universe is not necessarily on your shoulders but it flows and courses through you, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're refusing to see yourself in that temporal stream of past, present, and future because of some trauma, or if you're refusing to look to the future because you're afraid, then you're resisting the flow of the universe. And you're resisting that process of becoming yourself. And you may say, well, I have kids. I have a job. I have people that rely on me. I'm a breadwinner. Well, that's good. You know, if you, if you don't have time to overhaul yourself and to see yourself as being made of stars and being a universal um, Superman, which you are, but if you have a place in this life where you are of service and you are of value and you can't necessarily change the way that you're operating immediately or, 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 or maybe ever, then, then, then what you must do, I would say, Again, here I go preaching again, but what I have to personally do, really, this is, I just changed the tense for some reason, <laughs> or the perspective, but hell, we're all the same. We're all just universal stardust flowing from A to B, so I can tell you what to do, and it's really just the same thing as telling myself what to do. You have to go head first into those responsibilities, like seriously. And this is a, this is a reality check for me and a kick in the ass. It's like, well, what? You have something to do. You have people relying on you. There's a place where you provide value. You, you provide a unique uh, role you, that you're filling. And you're going to half-ass it out of spite. And you're not going to pursue anything better. Well, that's something like purgatory, right? That, that, that's that dead end where the you know 10 billion years and an, and an infinite amount of energy and weight is flowing into you. And then you're just going to be a dead end for that. The universe is crying out to flow through the 7 billion nodes that live on this planet. The nodes that it has now created and is trying to expand itself eternally through and you're going to resist that? A, good luck and B, realize that you're well on your way to being recycled. I mean, we're all getting recycled, period. But, well, I think about that Eric Clapton line. Damned if you're deceased in your own lifetime. So if that for me is the foundation of a, uh, a human revolution, a revolution of the self, seeing ourselves as being necessarily intertwined with the universe, you know, uh, deconstructing that barrier between the self and the rest of the universe. I mean, think about it, right? Like in some ways it's logical, I swear, you know, you are you and then everything is everything else? How are you just not everything else, you know? If we can start to break down those barriers of the self, a cultural revolution, a social revolution could stem from that. You know, I talked uh, on the last episode uh, that I did like this, I talked about tribal absurdism or cultural absurdism. That was the idea of uh, small communities of people who rally around the notion of of, of, of the idea that there is no rational or metaphysical meaning, you know, it's, it's, it's a group of people who say, who say, there is no meaning, I'm not going to allow the group to impose meaning, but I'm going to choose to be a part of the group anyway. You know, we could all just go off on our own chaotic ways, we could all just go rogue and attempt to attempt whatever. But instead, I'm going to buy in, I'm going to stay together in this group. And I, I really, the more I think about it, this is not a revolutionary idea, really. Uh, I'm sure it's been going on forever. Tribes. Platoons. Teams. Companies. Corporations. You know, but then it does get to a point, and 
ultimately what the problem is, as it always is, is that group, that group's rational meaning, that group's sense of what is important becomes too important and they start imposing it elsewhere. You know, what, what I think cultural absurdism or tribal absurdism would be, would be a, what I said, it would be a group of people who understand that life is inherently meaningless, but I'm choosing to live and I'm choosing to be a part of this group. And the, the, the real revolution, the real revolt is to not impose the meaning that I have found on anybody else. And it's not even, you're not even imposing it on the other people in the group. And that's where the bond comes from. We're all individually, consciously saying, this is what I'm choosing to do. You know, I think this has probably been going on forever. But as I, as I said, it's, it's when that meaning then takes on a life of its own in some sense and, and starts to be used as a weapon. You know, society necessarily atomizes into smaller and smaller groups, and yet we live together largely uh, for reasons of, uh, of personal fulfillment and for reasons of, of self-preservation and survival. You know, there's, there's resources, there's trade, there's commerce, there's sex, there's systems of value and desire. That's what brings us together always. You know, we use one another to fulfill ourselves. Really, the universe has, has, is what brings us together. It has found ways to flow from point to point, from node to node, endlessly through us. The conflict, the problem with humanity seems to be when the flow is resisted and revolt stops. The revolution has been ongoing, in fact. But when different tribes impose meaning upon other tribes, violent supremacy as the so-called logical end of being seems to be the built-in human flaw. And truly, I have no good answer for that. This is where I've, this is kind of where I have to, in some sense, get off the train. Right? If tribal absurdism is the way forward, you know, and even if the tribes can, can live amongst each other, we have to understand, we have to understand that we are all essentially the same. Now, to see ourselves as different is fine. For the purposes of survival, it's necessary. But it seems to me like when two tribes butt up against each other with a different understanding, when one of them claims a rational, metaphysical reason for being, then we go to war. When we're seeing it, we see it every day. And I have no answer for it. But I do believe, I do believe that the answer might be something like understanding the importance of you on an individual level. You are not a tool. You are not a pawn. You are not an idea. And ideas are not you either. You are a node which energy flows through. Period. The eternal, miraculous energy of the universe flows through you. How dare you impose a meaning on it? So I spoke yesterday to a gentleman uh, named Brad Bartko. And that, that episode will be released at some point. Truly, uh, Brad was like the, the ultimate, the penultimate guest for this show. Um, I should tell you that he has cerebral palsy. He's confined to a wheelchair. Uh, when he was born, extremely premature, uh, he was given 24 hours to live. And it's been 28 years for him. And I, It really got me thinking. I was like, man, in some ways, he is freer than the average person that I've met. Right? Because... He dealt with his mortality immediately. His whole life, he sees as a gift. You know, I think there's a real lack. I was listening to Zuby, the rapper, speaking with Joe Rogan a few weeks ago, and he said this too, and I think it's true. 
we're in a place now, not only are we soft as a culture, as a people, but we, we, we're not dealing with the fact that we're mortal. You know, we're not dealing with the fact that this universal energy that's flowing through us will one day cease to flow through you as you understand it. You know, your consciousness, the energy that fuels your body and your consciousness may hopefully uh, recapitulate somewhere else. But, you know, part of part of that part of that hard um, adherence to the self is what leads to this refusal of, of acknowledging mortality. You know what I mean? You get so in love with being that you refuse to acknowledge that it might end. I think that a lot of the moral grandstanding that we're seeing during this pandemic and the way it's been politicized, again, not taking a political stance on this, I'm more interested in the COVID pandemic as an observation on humanity. And a lot of the moral grandstanding, rightly or wrongly, is is seeing things external to the self and trying to impose um, my meaning on you. You may use science as the new religion, as this sort of infallible right and wrong. Of course, there's great benefit to it. Saved lives. But what right do you have (laughs) to morally grandstand? What right do you have to tell one person how to live or how not to live? And I'm not saying one way or the other, mask versus not mask, vax versus not vax, shut down versus don't shut down. It goes both ways. Teams formed and meaning was exchanged and and conflict resulted because people weren't allowing the flow of the universe to occur. They weren't allowing constructive, productive exchange. I think a culture that we live in now too is one of a mindless consumption. Bottomless social media feeds. Endless crap to watch on Netflix. Endless crap to eat, drink. And this this idea of being possessed with ideas, you know, seeing your identity as being based on a group identity, as being based on some immutable characteristic. Uh, you know, based on an based on an idea, frankly. That's what results from not dealing with our own mortality, right? It's allowing yourself, because if you really truly understood how fragile and how, um, how fragile and how fleeting this life is, you wouldn't do a lot of the things that you did. I know I wouldn't in the past for sure, but now I, I don't have time to get into discussions that have little consequence to my life truly right? Just don't have time. And I don't mean that in a, I don't mean that in a sort of offhanded derisive way. It's like, I don't have time to be a, to be a a place where the energy isn't flowing. So I was talking to Brad Barco, as I said, he's confined to a wheelchair, cerebral palsy, but he's freer than most people. I really do believe that because he dealt with his mortality literally on day one, when the doctor said you have 24 hours to, to live. So his whole life is, is a gift. His whole life could end at any minute in his eyes. His disability is pervasive. He can't, one, you know, there's not one second of his life where he's not in a wheelchair, where he's not unable to move, you know, where he's not, I don't want to say crippled, that's not fair, that's not right, but there's not in some way where he's not limited, disabled, prevented from doing things physically, at least by comparison that I would consider normal. And yet, that guy lives his life to the max. I don't want to give away too much of his story because I want you to hear it from him on the podcast uh, in the next week or so. But what also struck me was that he he ends up truly uh, where all heroes end up. And that's uplifting the community. That's what a hero does, right? Like that's in the in the classical sense of the hero's tale. There's that call to adventure, leaving the homeland, doing battle with the demons in the underworld, and there's some other points along the way, and then there's a return to the homeland to then share what he's taken, share what he's learned, share what he's gained to uplift others. So he talked about this idea of having a community, an entire community, like an entire neighborhood, 
built with accessibility in mind, right? Like a plate, like we don't see it so much if we're, if we're not tuned into it, but there's accessibility problems in every city and every place we go, you know, there's a lack of ramps for those in wheelchairs, you know, of course, now we see those kneeling buses, right? Where it's easy for someone with a wheelchair to get onto a bus. That's great. Uh, washrooms with grab bars so people can get on and off the toilet and in and out of the wheelchair. Things like that. He's talking about an entire community populated by people who are disabled. And also in that community would be the people that help care for them. All the infrastructure, all the housing, all the services are are tailored to those who are disabled. So it would be a complete revolution, a complete rolling back of our allegiance to the way society is and going forward in a revolutionary way, truly, to make a place where people who typically aren't served or are underserved can be fully served. In his words, fuck the government. Fuck the government. And I, I do really agree with that sentiment in some ways where I do think it would be private enterprise. Like if we're going to talk about the actual, um, you know, nuts and bolts of how a revolution might happen, it is private enterprise. It's heroes like Brad who who make a fortune. I don't know anything about his financial state, uh, um, his financial, uh, you know, condition at the moment, but he made it sound like he's doing all right for himself. He's a financial broker. He deals with money. That's his industry. And he's thinking big. He's thinking about a private enterprise where in every city in the world there could be a community for the disabled. Fuck the government. We have to play outside of that system, right? We have to actually, we have to actually roll back our allegiance to the old way of being, the old way of living, and the old way of governing, right? Like that's truly what a revolution would be. No half measures, really. And I do believe that heroes leading private business, private enterprise are the way forward. We cannot rely on the government <laughs> to do really anything. Anything revolutionary. No government would be in favor of a revolution, really. No sitting government. And that's a problem of power. That's a problem of imposing meaning, right? That's a problem of, of them being in power, saying, we've got all the answers. We're going to be a dead end for the flow of energy, for the flow of exchange, or for the process of exchange. Just just sit down and be quiet and let us now sort of allow the flow to happen as we choose. It's not good enough. So when I got to the end of this thought process, <laughs> I circled back to this idea that I was dealing with last month, uh, the idea of the individual and the collective, you know, the binary. I'm throwing that out the window. Because the individual, the collective, that's a, that's a, that's a needless binary. Right? Just like self and other is a needless binary here. We are the universe realizing itself. The individual is the collective. The collective is the individual. Right? The energy is flowing through these infinite nodes. We're all one. We are the universe realizing itself. The potential is infinite and the potential is eternal. If you don't resist it. I'll leave you with two things. I've, I've written this. Well, I haven't written anything, but I have this idea. about an elegy for summer. You know, the, the dog days of summer are well behind us. And those are real, by the way. It's when Sirius, the dog star, would return to the sky above the sun in some, in some cases. And it, it signaled the, the hot, hot days that, that sort of come toward the end of July into the middle of August, and that's over. <laughs> There's a hot one in Edmonton this year. Uh, the last summer moon is waning. You know, we had the full sturgeon moon on the 8th sorry, on the 22nd, and it's waning down to nothing, and it, that'll come just days before the fall equinox. You know, and you sense the way the sun isn't quite getting up as high as he, as he was a month ago, two months ago. 
Gets a little colder at night. It's colder in the morning. Sun gets up a little late. Like I said, doesn't get quite as high. <laughs> uh, we know what's coming, right? And, and the beauty is that we're alive to witness this descent, right? This drama of heat and light as it's gradually pulled back away from us. Uh, knowing full well that the revolution is upon us. The revolution in the first sense, rolling back. We're rolling back to that old predictable winter, but at the same time too, we're rolling back our allegiance to our old self if we want to. And we're going forward to a new self. You know, in some ways the universe, the cosmos, the solar system, the seasons are circular. They repeat and they also spiral out eternally. The revolution is upon us, around us, and within us. This is a piece of music by uh, one of my favorite musicians, frankly, uh, Electric Religious. He's based here in Edmonton. This song is called Revolution. Uh, thank you for listening to the North Bank Media Podcast, and in the words of uh, Tom Petty and Richard Manuel, wherever you are tonight, I wish you the best of everything. So enjoy this song. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you again soon. Day grows older and I'm still wired I'm far too restless to be inspired Outside of these walls is a wonderful world Listen to the sound, there's revolution lurking in the city In the city Listen to the sound, there's revolution lurking in the city She only wants to grow, but she's never gonna grow if we always cut her down. Listen to the sound, there's revolution lurking in the city, in the city. Listen to the sound, there's revolution lurking in the city, in the city. Listen to yourself, you got a heartbeat, yeah, you're sitting pretty. Sitting pretty Listen to the sound There's revolution lurking in the city In the city You can't grow where you've grown You can't grow